It is March 3rd, 2020. And this is day two of taking these milkweed seeds out of the fridge after being in there for two weeks. Nothing yet, no sprouting yet, but that's pretty typical, honestly, as to be expected. Day five. Alright, it is March 7th, 2020, and this is day five of the seeds being out of the fridge, and they have obviously grown quite a bit. Germination rate is great. Um, you can even see some seedlings trying to push the seed case off to expose their new leaves. So at this point is when I usually start transferring them into seed starting mix and seed starting trays. So we will do that in a little bit. It is March 9th, 2020. And we are seeing some serious growth. I'm gonna put these in seed starters tomorrow, I think. You can see the little leaves and all the little roots. So exciting. Yay! Hello, internet plant and butterfly friends. How are you? The world is crazy right now. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> I didn't do it, but I hope you guys are all healthy, safe, staying as calm as possible. I know it's easier said than done, but practice some self-care, hang out with your plants. Um, today's video is about the seed starting I've been doing for butterfly host plants. I am planting things for the monarch butterfly, of course, and the black swallowtail so far this year. I'm also going to show you various other seeds I am starting as well. So I think I'm just going to get into it. And then after that, I'm going to talk about the monarch population status. It is March 14th as I'm recording this. And as um, the United States is in a national state of emergency for the COVID-19, the virus pandemic, we also got the monarch population status on the same day. So it was a day, let me tell you. So yeah, I'm just gonna talk about seeds for a minute and then we'll talk about that. As you can see, I've got a bit of a mess on my kitchen table. Um, by the looks of it, you might be guessing what we're doing today. We are seed starting. Um, so within the last couple weeks, the monarchs have been reported as being very active in the overwintering sites, which suggests that they are going to start flying north from Mexico. If you want to follow along with that, um, check out journeynorth.org. And you can actually, um, if you see a monarch or they track other species on there too, like hummingbirds, um, if you see any of those creatures, you can report a sighting on there and it helps them understand um, migrations from various animals. Um, so what the first generation, will, this generation of monarchs will be doing is laying their eggs in the southern United States, so like Texas. And we typically see monarchs here late May at the earliest sometimes earlier it depends might be earlier this year with how mild this winter has been and with with how early spring is coming i kind of thought i'd get started on this um these seedlings are ready to go when they are about this point this is when i put them in starters you can just put them in starters after cold stratifying but i like to watch them um so I guess I'll walk you through everything I have today. Um, 
But yeah, I'm excited for the Monarchs to come back and uh, see their beautiful wings again. Um, I made my own seed starting mix, which is a mix of four different things. I usually use purple cow, but I just had this stuff laying around, so I thought I'd just mix my own instead of adding more bags to my space. <laughs> um, it's a mix of peat moss, vermiculite, perlite, and potting soil. So this is the peat moss mix that I used. You can just use it by itself, but I don't like to do that because it it does hold moisture decently, but when it's dry, it's really dry. So I don't like to use this by itself. Vermiculite is great because it provides aeration, but still holds moisture. So this is really awesome for seed starting. Um, this wouldn't be the same without it, honestly. And then obviously potting soil and then perlite for some aeration and drainage. Um, with seedlings, you want to get, you want to keep them consistently moist so their um, root systems develop. So you can see there's a lot going on here. Um, I'm actually going to show you the vermiculite. One second. I'm just gonna. So this is what the vermiculite looks like. It's um. It's a different kind of puff volcanic stone and it just holds on to moisture really well. It kind of feels like chunks of cork, honestly. So yeah, that's that. I'll put it back because I think I have enough to work with. Here's the mix. Um, I just have a paper plate so I don't make as much of a mess. Open this. Okay, sorry guys. So here is what the Seedlings look like being out of the fridge for a week after two weeks of cold stratifying. Um, I did take the other ones out from the 10th of February, so those should be starting soon. I don't think the timing makes much of a difference, but I just thought I'd try and see. If I find anything different, I'll let you know. Those, um, I save all these deli containers for like, I let my, I like to set my seed starting trays in these and water through the bottom. Um, I also like to use these for um, raising eggs to first in star caterpillars in these as well. So I have those. Um, here's a spray bottle. I just spray to keep the soil wet. Um, that. I have my seeds. So like I, these are the two. Well, this is one. That I had in cold stratification. Uh, they're all messed up. Sorry, this is not very organized. This is the other one I cold stratified. And then today, I will also be directly planting blood flower and butterfly weed. Um, these two do not need to be in the fridge. This is a tropical flower. It's not. It couldn't get cold if it wanted to, really. It's an annual up here. It's not native. This one is a perennial up here, but for whatever reason, it does not require cold stratification. I really like having this milkweed variety because it tends to bloom later around here, and that's very vital for pollinators late in the season when other pollen nectar sources might be dying off, especially the monarchs that are migrating south. They need to fuel up, and they have a big journey, so I really like to have this one around. What else do I have? I have some host plant seeds for the eastern black swallowtail. I'll pop the caterpillar right here to the right so you can see it. This is what they look like. So if you see these on your herbs in your garden, don't be uh, don't be afraid. Don't kill them. Let them be. They turn into beautiful butterflies, which I'll pop right here. But they like a lot of your. They like to eat a lot of common herbs, which are. My favorite to keep around are dill. And as you can see, the butterflies on the packaging. And it says, plant extra for the swallowtail butterflies. Will do. Um, parsley. And fennel. I do like to eat, well, cook with these three. So I plant extra for them and me. 
Um, I do tend to feed um, Queen Anne's lace throughout the season if I have caterpillars though, because it grows pretty readily around here. And that works as well. They they also like carrot tops. Um, what else do they like? They, they eat a bunch of different things. I think Golden Alexander. But these are three good herb staples to have in your garden that you can enjoy, but also have extra for the caterpillars. So I would consider doing that. So those are the seeds we're working with today. I just had cilantro. I, they can eat cilantro. I just, that stuff's, I like to have that around for salsa. And then I got this Jiffy Greenhouse, which I've never used this before, but I thought I'd give it a try because I like the cover so it can get like a greenhouse effect. So I'll have some of these in these trays, which I need, I know I need to clean them out. I'll do that off camera. And then I um, thought I'd try some in here just to kind of experiment and see. So I'm going to get everything kind of like situated and then I'll be back to plant the seeds. So I filled my trays with the uh, seed mix. Again, you don't have to make your own mix. You can buy it. I really like purple cow. We'll see how this little mixture does. So I'm getting these moist before I put the seeds in. And you see the stick up here? Um, that's actually for poking holes to plant the seed. holes now. All right, so these trays are all ready for planting. Here's what a seedling looks like. So, um, here's the root system. Uh, focus. Focus. See the root system right there, and then here's the leaves that um, the plant uses to push the seed casing off. So I just take them and get the roots in. It's really hard to do holding. I make sure the root system is nice and buried. And these guys have actually really strong, deep root systems, so I do only plant one seedling per cell because it will take them um it will take over the entire um cell with its roots because by the time i transplant these you'll be able to see roots like they'll be yay high and ready to go outside i might even put them in a different container after this we'll see when i get there but um yeah you can see a bunch of them some of them still have the uh, seed casing on. I plant them with the seed casing on. It'll push itself out. I just let them do their thing. I'm gonna probably, there's some seeds that haven't germinated in here, so I'm gonna probably still let them do their thing. But yeah, these are what the seedlings look like. Um, obviously, it didn't take very long at all. I took these out last week and they're already growing like crazy. So yeah, it's pretty neat, huh? Look at this guy, he's crazy looking. Early. Sorry, my finger's dirty. He's gonna be difficult to plant. <laughs> All right, so here is the um, Jiffy Greenhouse. All the peat pellets in there, all ready to go. Um, I have to add water to these. I have to see how much. But it also came with some labels and some, it looks like Super Thrive. I've heard of people using this for LECA a lot for nutrients. So, yeah, it came with these, and then it says I have to add approximately one eighth cup of warm water per, per pellet. All right, so I'm gonna follow all these directions off camera because um, <laughs> this looks a little involved, and I'm holding it so you guys can get the best angle. So I'm gonna get this set up, and we'll get planting. So see. You in Seems like a lot, and I just made a mess. About five and a half cups of water to this entire tray to get the uh, peat to expand. Look how quickly that evaporated. That's not even the full four cups. Like this thing holds four cups and I'm supposed to add another cup and a half. It's kind of fun to watch. That's fun. 
I like this. Look at look look at it soak up the water. That's crazy. I love it. All right, so I got my labels ready, and then I also got these peat pellets ready. I had to expand them with my fingers, which was really satisfying. And then I'm supposed to sow two to three seeds per hole, which were already kind of in here, which is super helpful. I really actually am very impressed with this greenhouse system. So um, I'm gonna get these seeds in and uh, I'm so excited for the planting season, you guys. I know it's still a couple of months away for uh, Zone 5A where I am in Madison, Wisconsin, but uh, at least this gives me something to look forward to come summer and like late spring, early summer. So yeah, I'm gonna get these guys all planted. So what I actually am gonna do is do each row a different seed. I have six different kinds of seeds. It came with six different um, labels and it has six rows. So that works out because I didn't really uh, pay attention to that. I'm gonna start with fennel. And these are what the seeds look like. Um, you'll often see these at Indian restaurants. They kind of smell like licorice-y. Um, yeah, these grow really nicely. They are a perennial for my zone, zone 5A. I'm gonna go ahead and get these guys planted. This is too hard to do, so I'm gonna do this off camera. <laughs> so the fennel is supposed to take uh, seven to 14 days to sprout, or slash germinate, I guess. Germinate's the proper word. This is parsley, and this is supposed to take 14 to 28 days. Much smaller than the fennel. As you can see here. So that's parsley. And here's dill. And this takes about seven to 14 days as well. So here we have the um, Mexican blood flower or tropical milkweed seeds. All milkweed seeds look pretty similar, but I've noticed these guys look a lot smaller. Um, I don't necessarily need to plant them, but I like the look of them. And uh, something to keep in mind is that if you're in a southern region and this stuff just grows all year round, um, please cut your plants back because um, there's a lot of diseases that get carried by butterfly wings, which uh, one of them, which I will explain is OE, which gets carried by the scales on the adult butterflies and they fall off like Christmas glitter. And if you're not cutting your plants back, that stuff's just gonna live and thrive on the milkweed until a caterpillar ingests it and ultimately gets infected. So it's a good idea to cut your milkweed back every so often anyways, but especially if you live in the South where that OE, which is electros, God, I'm gonna butcher this, Ophriocystic electroscira is more prominent, definitely be cutting your milkweed back. Up here in the North upper Midwest, we don't have to worry about OE as much, we do get it. Occasionally, I've never dealt with it, um, but our milkweed dies back in the fall, it freezes and all those spores die. So just something to keep in mind with tropical milkweed if you live in the South. And lastly, this is the butterfly milkweed. And both milkweeds can take anywhere from seven to like 20 days to sprout. But for me, it's usually somewhere in between for the um, tropical milkweed and the um, Mexican blood flower. The species that I cold stratify, so the showy milkweed and the common milkweed, I definitely have way more luck with them germinating within even like four days. Now we're going to talk about the monarch population status. Um, you might see me look down at these notes quite a bit because um, there's a lot of data and numbers. 
This graph was compiled by, by Monarch Watch, which is the tagging program based out of the University of Kansas, which I will get into when the time comes this year. Anyways, so the Monarch population at the overwintering sites in Mexico is compiled by the WWF, World Wildlife Fund in Mexico, CONAND, the National Commission of Natural Protected Areas in Mexico, and Monarch Butterfly Biosphere Preserve. And this measurement is done in hectares, which is a total forest area occupied. It's a surface area measurement. So, um, the, I mean, the graph shows you a trend from the 90s and shows you it each year. And one thing to keep in mind with this is that um, with populations, you will always see a rise and fall. They fluctuate for various reasons. Sorry, the cat decided to get on my lap. So you will see rises and falls in any population. It's just how it goes. But we're looking for an overall trend, which is going down. But so we're kind of trying to base this data off of cur more so current years. And obviously the overall trend is decreasing. We know that this population is in kind of like a crisis mode, but it's just good to see recent trends um, to see how it is sustaining itself. But so, so this fall, Chip Taylor of Monarch Watch predicted that we would see around 4.7 hectares of occupied area by the monarchs in the overwintering sites. This was it was predicted that there would be a decrease from the previous year, which was 6.05 hectares, which was crazy growth from the year before. Um, we knew that this decrease was happening because we had less than optimal egg distribution. At least where I was, it was a very, very rainy spring. And when it's raining, the monarchs aren't gonna breed and lay eggs. They seek shelter in trees and roost. They do not fly around. It's just what it is. So we knew that was a factor. Um, they also came back late and flew south late. The temperatures last summer overall were cooler and we also, which also slows monarch activity. They're cold blooded. If they're cold, they're just gonna chill. It's just how it goes. Um, there were also droughts in Texas. So that's not great because that is a big stopping point for them. There are four generations of monarch per season. And the so the gener I'll get into this once we kind of hit that point in the season. So the generation of butterfly that flies south is the fourth generation. Those are the ones at the overwintering site. They are act they actually live longer and are more physically aerodynamic than the first three generations of a season. So they fly south in the winter, they roost in Mexico, they fly back up, they stop in Texas. Um, a lot of them, some of them will fly back all the way up to where they came from. Some of them might come back to Wisconsin. But for the most part, most of them fly up to Texas, breed, and then their life expires. So the offspring they have in Texas are mostly what we see. So their generation's offspring are what we typically see in Wisconsin and other places in the springtime. And it's important to remember that every generation has some overlap. Again, I will explain this more in depth once we get to this point in the season. So that more or less explains why Texas is a very important area for the butterflies because it is a, a big pit stop on the way south and it is a big breeding area on the way back north. You can monitor and report any sightings to journeynorth.org, please do. They don't just follow the monarch butterfly, but they also follow other species that migrate as well, including hummingbirds, which I did not know migrated until like a couple years ago. Um, but anyways, so we saw a 53.22% decrease from 6.05 hectares. And that number was 2.83 hectares. That's not really close to 4.7-ish that Chip Taylor predicted. So we did get these numbers late this year. Um, typically, this data is typically reported around, um, I wanna say last year we got this chart end of January and it is mid-March right now. So they wanna take weather and other environmental factors into account when recording this data so we can get the best accurate 
so we can get the most accurate population understanding. And this forested area was apparently covered by 11 monarch colonies. So these environmental factors are taken into mind, but also we did have a couple troubling deaths in Mexico earlier this year. Um, two monarch activists, I will put their names here because I cannot pronounce them, were murdered in Mexico and there's a lot of controversy with illegal logging for avocado farming. I'll leave a couple articles about it below you can read on your own time, but basically in a nutshell, these deaths are very suspicious and the land where the sanctuaries are is very precious. So people want to protect the butterflies, people want the land for agriculture. So I'm not saying don't buy an avocado. <laughs> we don't know the answer. And there is plenty of legal avocado farming down there. It's fine. Um, but those deaths were suspicious and I'm sure there was questions about, you know, people being safe in the area, the people who were you know, looking and tracking this data. So that may have been a factor. I don't know for sure, but it's a thing that happened and it's very sad for the families that lost these two men. It's, it's too bad that they had to lose their lives for a cause such as this. It's very important. Um, so with all this being said, all we can do is plant more milkweed. If you're not sick of me saying that already, I'm gonna keep saying it. We need to plant all the milkweed. Um, you can raise to help spread awareness for the butterfly as well. I'll get into that. So you can look forward to more videos coming on that, especially as um, their arrival approaches. As I'm recording this, there is activity north with the butterflies. I'm so excited for them to come back. It's one of my favorite times of year. Um, they're just a beautiful creature. I really look forward to them coming back and um, kind of like racing to the finish line this season. Um, it could be the last, maybe it won't be. Maybe they'll just push the decision again, which would be fine with me, I don't care. Just don't put them on the endangered species list. I don't trust, I don't trust you guys to give them the habitat that they need to survive. So yeah, we just need to plant more milkweed going forward. Um, as I mentioned in my uh, repotting video, we need to plant 1.4 billion milkweed stems, especially in the upper Midwest based on one study. And that is enough to sustain the population with a buffer. So this takes into account growth to where it was back in the 90s. So this is kind of bringing the population back to where it was in the 90s, as well as taking into account that there will be rises and falls in population. So we need to give them that buffer if there should be any natural disasters or anything like that. So definitely plant some milkweed. Um, if you are going to raise from seed, you can follow along with me or there's plenty of resources out there. Always, always, always check out Mr. Lone Science's channel. He has amazing butterfly raising videos, information on the population status as well. He does a much better job than I do. In my opinion, he's a science teacher, so he's very thorough and much better at being on camera in my opinion. And also um, he has some great milkweed videos as well. So he has all those resources for you. When planting milkweed from starts, just a couple things to keep in mind. Um, if you are buying from a nursery, make sure the milkweed is not sprayed with any insecticides. Um, they might be even if they're labeled organic because there are a lot of organic insecticides that are used. So if you're gonna go that route, just make sure you call your nursery and ask if they are have been sprayed at all because there wouldn't be much of a point planting the start and then having a mama butterfly lay her egg, the caterpillar hatches, tries to eat the leaf and then dies from poisoning. So we don't want that to happen. We're trying to give them the best chance. Sure, they can enjoy the flowers. All bees and butterflies love milkweed flowers. They are a great native plant to have in your, in your butterfly garden just for that reason, but we want to provide host plants for them as well. That is the most important thing when it comes to helping the monarch butterfly. Um, also keep in mind of where you plant. Most areas that you can plant are okay, but it is t a toxic plant. Um, 
So don't get it in your eyes and don't let any animals eat it. Don't plant it by any pastures where a horse could be grazing or cow could be grazing. Any livestock could be grazing, eat the plant and get sick. We don't want that to happen. So that's just something to keep in mind. But plant all the milkweed in your yards. Um, and definitely, I'm kind of, I'm kind of hoping that even though this COVID-19 thing that's happening right now is kind of terrible <laughs> and weird for everybody, um, there will be less cars driving all around. Maybe this is good for climate change. I don't know. I'm not a scientist. I don't know. But I'm hoping that is something that good that could come out of it. Um, and honestly, planting a butterfly garden in this time could be very useful and rewarding as well. And it's very therapeutic. Indoor gardening is very therapeutic. It's so good for the mind and soul. I actually stopped by my local greenhouse store today. It's walking distance, so it's a little dangerous. I shared this guy on Instagram, but this is a spathoglottis orchid. It's a terrestrial orchid. I saw it there when I went shopping with Meg in my last video and I just couldn't get it out of my mind. So I was like, you know what? Small businesses might be hurting right now. I'm gonna go pick up a plant I want and give them some business. There were some other people shopping there, so that was good to see. Um, in Wisconsin, all our schools are closed and also gatherings are limited to 250 right now. Um, obviously this changes day by day. Um, but if you get any plants during this pandemic, um, let me know what you get. It would be cool to see how you supported a small business and what plants we get during this time. Um, I'm guessing online ordering is probably a good choice too. Keep it positive with, I think this is a great time for the plant community to come together, enjoy the plants they already have, talk to others, just get excited about something positive. So let's plant all the milkweed and help the monarch butterfly. So please continue to follow this series and check out all the other resources below about how you can help the monarch butterfly and uh, definitely hit subscribe, hit the bell so you don't miss an upload. Give this video a thumbs up and you can always, 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 always ask me any questions about this. Um, I'm an open book. You can hit me up on here. You can hit me up on Instagram. Um, and thank you to everybody who has reached out to me so far about how you're planting milkweed, about how you want to plant milkweed and how you want to help the monarch butterfly. It, that in itself means the world to me. It means the world to me that even one person would reach out and say they want to help. Um, if you have a platform and please encourage your friends and family to watch this video or watch Mr. Lund Science's videos, check out Monarch Watch, tell your friends and family how they can help with the butterfly too, because we're all in this together. Um, I truly think we can make a difference no matter what happens especially in December with the population status, planting milkweed will always help. So yeah, let's get out there and plant all the milkweed. We can do this. And also thank you for helping the pollinators. So thank you guys so much for watching and helping the monarch butterfly and other pollinators. And I will see you next time. Bye.